So, <laughs> yeah. so confidence intervals, a lot of this is repetitive. Um, it's going to be repetitive. But, um, what you do have to understand is, you know, what, it's all word problems. What calculator trick, basically, are they dealing with, okay? That's kind of the gist. Um, can you determine which particular situation you're dealing with? So a confidence interval is very big. Once you start to get into this, let's go in that one. Once you start to get into this um, confidence intervals and hypothesis testing before the end of the semester, this is kind of more of the real stuff you see a lot in the medical field. Um, I mean, obviously you see, you know, mean and standard deviation, and you see data sets and all that kind of stuff. But a lot of a lot of stuff, if you look up you know, testing a medication or uh, whatever, you'll see either an integral of values or you might see like a hypothesis test. The p-value is this and thus we reject this, that. And for now, at this point in time, you guys probably don't know that yet, but you will hopefully by the end of the semester. Um, confidence intervals using sample statistics to approximate population parameters. So, <laughs> your notation and the concept of sample versus population and um, and um, statistic versus parameter is really, really important now. So I, I talked about that from jump, but it's really, really important. So just to refresh sample pop, you guys are going to need to know your notation if you don't already know it for um, you have mean and you know a sample mean is x bar population mean is mu standard deviation sample standard deviation is s population standard deviation is sigma and that is a huge deal now the difference between the two and understanding the difference between the two and hopefully being able to decipher whether you have a sample standard deviation or a population standard deviation from a word problem and then proportion, which you've seen, um, p hat is sample proportion, and then p, these are lowercase p's, is um, population proportion. And uh, if you don't remember what a proportion is, a proportion is basically like a fraction of a total. So um, it could be represented as a fraction, it could be represented as a decimal, it could be represented as a percentage. So if I have like my stat students or whatever, and I talk about the proportion of my stat students that have, you know, let's say brown, um, brown hair, I don't know, let's call it like eight out of 12, whatever. Eight out of 12, simplify that, you know, that's my proportion. Um, and then I can convert it into a decimal and a percentage if I want. So you have proportion for sample and you have proportion for population. So you want to be able to decipher between these. Notation is important, and then understanding what it means um, when it comes to word problems too. Okay, hopefully that makes sense. I may put this up for a second. All right, so. <clears throat> All right, before I do any problems, <laughs> I'm going to show you the three scenarios that you guys are going to deal with, okay? Uh, first, and this, this goes along with um, hypothesis testing also, and this is basically this week and next week. So this week and next week is a combination of this stuff, okay? So this applies to week 10 and week 11. So you're doing a confidence interval for a proportion. And I'm just going to put the calculator tricks here too. If you're doing a population, I'm sorry, if you're doing a confidence interval for a proportion, the calculator trick for that is one prop the int, and I'll show you where to find that. If you're doing a confidence interval for a mean, you have to decide either A, 
is sigma known, and I'm going to write that sigma. Sigma is your population standard deviation. So now knowing whether we have this or not is very important. <clears throat> if sigma is known, then you use what's called the interval. And then if sigma is unknown, we have a new distribution that we, may, we need to learn. Let's see if I have, and that's called T interval. So you guys have seen these scores and you've seen, you know, values corresponding to that, but you haven't seen T scores. And that is <laughs> for the rest of the semester, you're going to be seeing that. Um, so these are your calculator tricks for the situation. Now, I'm not, I can't remember if you guys do T this week or next week, because if you do T next week, then what I will do is maybe talk about it tomorrow or and just focus on the stuff that we kind of know. Let me just see, these are some examples from so far. I think this week we're not dealing with the T situation yet. If I have time at the end, what I'll do is I'll come back to that. It looks like my examples all deal with. This assignment. Let me see if the second assignment here has any T stuff. Um, yeah. Okay, so you are starting the T stuff. Okay. Um, so we have a lot to talk about. <laughs> All right, let me copy and paste one of these then because. Let me grab a problem from <clears throat> all right. This is it. Yeah, it this all right, so I'm gonna do my best to cover as much as I can today. We'll see what we can get to. So it looks like this week you guys are dealing with just means. You're not dealing with confidence intervals for proportions yet. You're dealing with confidence intervals for means, which that's going opposite direction, but you know, whatever. You're gonna have to do some reading, you know, this week. You're gonna have to do a little bit of um information gathering, but I will tell you that um, I'm going to use an example at the top of my head. Yeah, I just posted the T one. I was trying to post the T one. OK, perfect. Yeah, that one. That one's from the first assignment, right? So all right, so. There's some terminology that you're going to want to know. Um, yeah, you guys are definitely going to need to uh, go through some of the, you know, um, either textbook or you're going to do some reading on the confidence intervals. But I'm going to give you an example. Let's assume that I have. Um, Let's talk about my statistics students as a sample of a population of statistics students, right? And um, my population, or the population is decided to be, let's say, all statistics students in the U.S. Now, obviously, my my statistics, my statistics students, you know, that's if you want to talk about a confident, a convenient sampling method, that would be a very bad sampling method. Me taking my statistics students, but. Let's just use that as the sample. Let's assume that I want to approximate the average salary for all statistics students um, in that population. So I, I don't know anything about the population, right? Let's say I don't know the population. Um, I don't know the average salary for the population. I want to approximate it. And confidence interval will allow you to do that um, with an interval of values representing the salary for the population. 
So how do you determine those numbers for that interval? You're going to use whatever you have for your sample. Your sample is representative of the population, right? Or it should be. There's rules regarding that. But let's assume that my sample is a representative of the population. And I can go ahead and use the average salary from my sample, do a little calculation and such. And um, we have something called margin of error and things like that to indicate that there is obviously a possibility of error. And um, I'm going to show you something in a second. But I can use what I, I know for my sample to approximate things for the population. Does that make sense? So I'm using sample statistics to approximate population parameters, right? Yeah. It's, she, you're looking at you're looking at exactly what I'm I'm looking at, Anisha too. Um, so, but I, I need to give you a little background because, you know, when I get to these kind of things, right? <clears throat> and this might be a good first one to do because it asks for a lot of pieces. So you're gonna have what's called a critical value, and the critical value is the value that you're gonna use to basically approximate your population parameter. You're going to use what's called a margin of error, and a margin of error is basically how far away from the sample and from the population values are. Um, and then there's different ways to represent your interval. So I think this is a good example uh, to start off with because you, you're asked for a critical value. And if you guys saw, I'm going to rewrite that so it looks a little better. If you guys saw uh, my video, wait back way back when you started inverse norm I, I had a video regarding critical value so you're going to need to know how to find that now so this is like an example of a problem that you would be given a researcher wants to know how it and you can see my screen right you can see my my a researcher wants to know you can see that part correct make sure you can see the right thing okay a researcher wants to know how long it takes on average for a certain species of bacteria to divide all right so he wants to know on average what it takes for the population of the certain species of bacteria to divide okay he doesn't know or she sorry she watches 25 cells all right so she has a little sample size here so let's talk about n is 25. she has 25 cells that she's watching through a microscope and times how long it takes for them to divide. So she's talking about her sample and she can gather information about her sample. She wants to basically use the sample to approximate something for the population. Here's her sample. We'll talk about that in a second. Assuming the population standard deviation is known. You see this right here? Um, that notation is called sigma. And sigma is the population standard deviation. So if you are either given it directly, which you are here, that's nice, nice of them. You don't always have to be given it directly. Sigma is equal to this. You could be told something regarding the population and the standard deviation, and you'd have to indicate whether that is a population standard deviation or a sample standard deviation, which I could kind of, I could tell you how to do that as well. So, um, Construct a 92% confidence interval for the average time it takes this species of bacteria to divide. So this is an example of a problem that you would get, you know, when you're dealing with a confidence interval. You have some, some information you want to um, know about a population. You have a sample representative of that population. Let's assume everything is cool, the way we sampled it. You know, we can use our methods, right? All the requirements are met. Um, and we want to basically determine you know, an approximate average for the population for this particular species to represent the, the particular species of bacteria and how long it takes them to divide overall for the population. OK, so. I want you to notice that you're dealing with average. You want to know average, you want to know on average, you, you know, you're dealing with means so that's something that you want to think about when you're dealing with you know which situation you have we're just starting with means for now okay and then if you're dealing with means you have to decide which you know situation you have is sigma known or sigma unknown i'm not talking about this yet okay because we haven't even talked about a student t distribution so we do know that sigma is known because the population standard deviation is known 
So if I'm trying to figure out, you know, which calculator trick to use or which situation it is, um, it's really out of these three, okay? So I determined that it's, you know, the second one because I want to talk about a mean and I know that sigma is known, okay? Now there's other information that, you know, they're asking me in this particular problem because using the formula or going through, you know, this process by hand is obviously a little bit more cumbersome than doing it with the calculator. I'm going to go straight to the calculator, but there are certain pieces that you do need to know how to find if you were doing it by hand, like margin of error. You could use a formula or you could use a trick that I'm going to show you um, from your calculator or using the calculator to give you your um, integral. Um, but this is asked to see if alpha over two. So you see that you're asked to construct a 92% confidence interval. This is called the confidence level. This is the level of confidence that you are. Confidence level, okay? And you'll see in your interpretation at the bottom, this is the interpretation, we are 92% confident that this species of bacteria takes on average. So that's basically, that's basically how confident you are, right? That's called the confidence level. And that can change. That's not always gonna be 92%. That can vary. Okay, but it's given to you. <clears throat> and that's telling me the type of confidence interval that I want. How confident do I want to be in this interval, right? Now, X bar, that's easy to find because um, I have a bunch of data values here. But I'm going to show you how to find that um, using this process, what we call Z interval here, okay? So I'm going to skip part A first. Let's call this part A. I'm going to go to B. And I want to go to B because... B has a notation for what you call the critical value. And <clears throat> this is only really needed when you're using the formula to calculate a confidence interval. However, it is also needed, um, you need to know the process of finding a critical value when you get to hypothesis testing as well. Because when you get there, you know, we're kind of skipping this part of, you know, um, co confidence interval methods. We're skipping this part using the calculator trick but, because I'll show you the formula, but I still want you to know how to find it. And basically this question is asking for each of these directly. You still need to know how to find it because of the fact that um, you're gonna need it later on when you get to hypothesis testing. And everyone always forgets how to do it because you skip it kind of um, when you're doing the calculator trick. So it's important to know how to find a critical value. So this part is critical value. Now, I did skip part B of this problem, which asks for alpha over 2. Technically, this is like really a baby step because you should know to do that because the critical value notation has that in it. But, okay, what is alpha? So alpha, um, and then I think this might be the first time you guys are seeing alpha, isn't it? Alpha, you're going to see it a lot. Alpha, in this particular case, it's the complement of the confidence level. So you find your alpha based on your confidence level. So I have a 92% confidence level for this particular problem. And so to find my alpha, I'm going to do 1 minus that. So 0 0.08. And there is an interpretation of alpha, and we could talk about that later. But you know, um, for now, I want to just show you how to find some of these pieces. So this is, this is your alpha. Um, alpha, it's another Greek letter, and in this particular case, you could find alpha for confidence um, intervals. You find it by doing the complement of the confidence level, which is always given it given to you. And you guys can stop me and ask questions if you need to, but I'm trying to I'm trying to give you as much background as I can without you. Let's just, assuming you don't know anything, you guys are going to have to definitely look into some stuff because I can't get into everything. There's a lot of pieces, okay? Even though there's a lot of pieces though, it's still doable and it's still repetitive. It's just a matter of which situation you're on and what goes along with each of those situations. Okay, so again, confidence level is given to me and that's the type of confidence interval that I want. That's how confident I wanna be. And alpha is the complement of that. So alpha is in this particular example, you know, one minus 0.92, which is 0.08. So, 
Part B asks for alpha over two, and there's a reason it asks for that because the notation for the critical value is dealing with that. And really all that is doing is telling you to take what you know for your alpha and divide it by two. Okay, and then, you know, you guys can use your calculators. I hope you have your calculators, you're doing it with me. So 0.04, okay? So that's it for that one. Sometimes I get questions about it, just maybe the notation makes people uncomfortable. It's not that hard. It's not that bad. And it's needed for the critical value. That's why they're asking you in pieces for this particular question. Not every question is gonna ask for all these pieces, but all these pieces go along with finding a confidence interval. And technically, if you were using the formulas and doing it by hand kind of thing, you'd have to go through all these pieces to get to the interval every time. But so it is important to know the pieces. Okay, now Z of alpha over two. If you guys ever saw my video, and I don't think I did it in um, in the Q and A, but I did it in my own video talking about critical values. This is a critical value, and this value is used to, to calculate. Um, one, two, technically on part A. <clears throat> and for part A, using, using um, what do you call it, your formula, the critical value is how you actually um, calculate your margin of error. So it's needed to calculate your margin of error. But since we have the TI-84s, I have a trick to get away from that. But that's where it's needed for this. And that's, again, why Sometimes we forget how to do them later on because we can skip this using our calculator trick. But the formula requires a critical value. Now, the reason you're taking alpha and splitting it into two pieces is technically because you have a confidence interval, which means you have a lower end and a higher end, right? So when I have a lower end and a higher end, obviously, I have two particular areas, right? Now, I don't only really need one of these. It doesn't matter you know, which one I find. Um, I'm, I, we always typically find the positive one because our formulas deal with the positive and negative case. So um, when you guys are finding an interval, you say, if it's for a mean, that the population mean is between, and I hope you guys remember this kind of stuff from like algebra. You're gonna see a little bit of notation from college algebra like this, less than, less than. So. I would take the sample mean and subtract the margin of error to get the lower part of this interval that represents the population mean. And I would take the sample mean and add this margin of error to get the higher end. And then I get an interval of numbers that is representing the population mean. Okay, so I'm, I'm using my sample statistics to approximate a population parameter. Um, and if you can see, we're subtracting E and adding E, so that takes care of the positive and negative kind of situation because I have two particular like locations of, of you know, values representing these areas. So alpha over two, which is 0 0.04, is the area that is corresponding to the critical value. So again, <clears throat> knowing how to find a critical value is important. Obviously, if the question asks for it directly, which some of yours, I think a couple of them, do in either situation this week or next week, but using the calculator trick, I could technically jump straight to part E. However, if I were using the formula, I'd have to go through these processes, right? And it's very important to know how to find a critical value because you are going to need that process later on when you get to hypothesis testing. And I don't want you guys to forget it. So I'm, gonna, I'm talking about it, not to mention some of the questions asked for it directly. Um, <clears throat> and then your margin of error. Is, is important too because it's technically if you see kind of how far away how far away from the actual values we are because I'm subtracting it and I'm adding it so I'm like margin of error on either side of the sample mean. Um, okay so this is the notation I'm taking alpha over two sticking it in a tail and then I want to find the corresponding z score which inverse norm. So inverse norm is how we find a critical value if we are looking for a critical value for a confidence interval or later on for hypothesis testing inverse norm if we're on a standard normal distribution curve. 
which we're dealing with z-scores with sigma known. So you guys can see my calculator, second bars, inverse norm. And then, you know, if you guys have the option, choose area to the right if you, if you have that option. I think most of you guys that are watching do not have this option. So if you do not have this option, like if you're using the app, second bars, you don't have the option to tell it, you know, it, where's the area. So you're going to automatically have to tell the area to the left of the value that you want. So this is where you would do the 1 minus for area, 1 minus 0 0.04, and then comma, mean, and then comma, standard deviation, and then technically your calculator automatically does the same thing here. If you're using this one, then you can tell it the area to the right because you can go ahead and go, hey, I want the area to the right. That area is located in the right. So this is where I don't have to do the 1 minus. If you have that option, you get the same thing. 1.75. So my critical value and does it say how to that one? 1.75. Let me see if it says any rounding. Typically, Z scores we round to two. But let me just double check. Round to three in this one. Just in case. Because if it does tell you how to round, you want to follow that. <clears throat> it looks like it's taking a bunch of values for you guys. So you could take a few of them. 1.7507. And technically, I would use this to find my margin of error. So if I'm using a value to continue for calculations, then um, you do take a bunch of those digits to the right of the decimal. Okay, so technically so far, you know, the only thing that has changed, the only things, notation, maybe what the question is asking for, okay? Um, this is something we know how to do already, inverse norm, okay? And then if you're using, you know, the app is one minus, that's where you do the one minus because of the fact that we have area to the right and it has to be given area to the left. Now, I told you guys, and this is, we all have calculators. We all have something that we're using, either Desmos, Graphic Calculator, your question. Okay, let me just. Um, we're all using some kind of calculator, some kind of, so we can avoid the formula, but that's my formula if I'm using the margin of error. I would just plug it in. Um, I'll show you. I'll show you both. Okay, so you would take your critical value, 1.7507. Right, and multiply by sigma over the square root of n, which we have all those values already. Sigma is given to me, 1.2, divided by the square root of n, which is given. Okay. Now, this is if I'm using the formula, which I take that value and multiply it by 1.2, divided by the square root of n. Notice. So 0 0.42, 0 0.4202. And margin of error, we typically want a lot um, of digits because, again, we're going to use it for later things. Now, I'm going to show you probably both ways, both methods on finding the confidence interval. Um, I told you guys, technically, we've got a lot of values here. Technically, we can jump to part E if we want to, because um, we have everything we uh, we have everything we need to use the graphing calculator. But if we're using formulas, then we have to go through this process to get to this. So that's why this question is basically walking you through that. But <clears throat> every time I teach this, <laughs> everywhere I teach it, even if I show the formula initially, everybody's like, "Nah, yo, just tell me the graphing calculator trick." So that's what I'm going to do. I mean, I gave you the formula. You could look at it. Um, I could, technically, I'm showing you the formula, too, because we did it. And then I'll show you here how to do that there. But <clears throat> graphing calculator trick. We need to input all these values into the graphing calculator. And not every question is going to have a list of data values. This one does. So I want to say this one's a little bit harder than the other ones because it, it is a list of values. So we have to input that. I haven't input that into my calculator. So hopefully, we all remember how to input, stat, and edit 
information into a list. So I want to erase L1 for me. So I'm going to scroll up and go clear, enter, and erase L1. Let me see for the app. If I go to stat and edit, let's assume I have, is it still clear, enter? Let me scroll up if you want, clear, enter. Okay, so you see how on the app, it did not erase my list. If I want to erase a list, it didn't erase it. So for the app, okay, this is important. It's not for the physical calculator because the physical calculator is clear enter. But if you're using the app and you want to clear out a list, you scroll up and you press delete. This is just for the app though, okay? If I want to clear out a list in the app. And the reason that I'm saying it's just for the app because if I do that on the graphing calculator, the physical graphing calculator, it's going to get rid of L1. The whole thing it's going to start at l2 you don't want to get rid of l1 you want to get rid of what's in l1 so if you have again the graphing calculator the physical you scroll up to l1 and you go clear enter to clear it you see that and if you have the app just put in some random stuff and you want to clear the list clear enter is not going to work so you press delete here it's not deleting the list but but on that on the calculator it would so just be careful so we have to put all these values in. So let's do it. How did you get to that? I don't know how to find that on my computer. I've been back to never seen that before. <laughs> the list? Yeah, I don't know anything about the list. <laughs> oh, stat. And then edit, which is number one. And it's really important you know how to do that because you're gonna do it, you're gonna do it later. This is this is important. You want to know where to put values if you have them. Like some of these problems are going to give you a list of values. Some of them won't. This one does. So let's put them in. 7.4 is 25. 8.6, if you guys are watching this recording, you could you know, fast forward, pause it, and then fast forward. 8.6, 6.1, 6.1, because I am recording this, and I did not pre-enter this stuff. 8, 7.9, 7.7. Let me shut up so you guys can do it, and I don't want to mess up your numbers. Enter all these things in. See, I'm on now, I'm on uh, number 16. So if I lose my spot, I could just count 16 and that's where I'm at. So I'm on 5.4. You guys are going to have to. I'm going to have to tag this one, so hopefully they don't play tricks on me. Okay, I'm almost done. You guys tell me when you are, because we're doing this together. So look, see, I have 25 values because I'm on 26. So that means that I entered 25 numbers. Hopefully they're all correct. If I need to re you know, go through it again, I will. So tell me when you guys have those in, because I want you to follow me on the calculator. I'm very lost. I can't even get my calculator to whatever trick you did to erase stuff. It's mine's all jacked up. <laughs> all right. What do you have, the app or the um, physical calculator? I have the actual calculator. All right. Go to stat and then edit. And if you want to clear a list, which I'll just put random problems here, you're going to scroll up so that in, you know, in your case, L1 is highlighted, then press clear and enter to clear the whole list so that you could start fresh and then you know, input these numbers. So you press 6.5, enter, 7.4, enter. So yeah, if you have anything in there, you want to clear it first so you don't you know, mix yourself up. Tell me if that worked. Sarah, I see your hand, what's up? 
Yeah. My problem is how do uh some of this question. Like how do you know when to um use um T score? Is it T or Z? Z very score. good, very good question. I haven't even talked about T yet, but this is it right here. If you're dealing with a proportion, it's always Z scores. The only time you're gonna use T is if you're doing a confidence interval for a mean and sigma is unknown. That's the only time. Sigma being the population standard deviation. That's the only time you're doing T. And I'll do an example using T after this, okay? But um, but this is the gist, right? So this is the gist. I sent, um, I'm gonna send it to you guys too. I sent my students, like, I'll show you. I'll show you after. Remind me to, to show you my little reference sheet, my little calculator reference sheet um, after. I sent it to my students. I put it in announcements if you guys have me. Um, and I put it in the chat here after too. But Z scores always when you're dealing with proportions. Z scores when you're dealing with means and sigma is known. And then T scores when you're dealing with means and sigma is unknown. Only time you use T is when sigma is unknown and you're dealing with the mean. Only time. Other than that, it's always Z. And I haven't even talked about T yet, so <laughs> right now we're just doing Z because we've seen Z before. But that is a very good question because you're going to have to decide that when you guys are doing stuff this week, next week. And then later on for hypothesis testing. That is a big deal. Okay. Um, tell me if you guys have the data set in. Yes. Okay, right, cool. Now, <clears throat> the reason I skipped part A is because finding the confidence interval for this will also give me the sample mean. That's the nice thing about this trick. Now, but if you guys want to recap, you know, when you went to stat and calc, I don't know if you remember one bar stat, that was how we did it back in chapter whatever, week three or something, that's the sample mean, right? But <clears throat> if I'm going to find the interval, I might as well just find the mean later then with it. So I know that I'm looking for, again, a confidence interval for an average, right? A confidence interval for an average time. Confidence interval for a mean. And sigma is known. They give it to me. So let me go to my list here. I'm looking for a confidence interval for a mean or an average, and sigma is known. So this is part A. And so I'm going to use Z interval. OK, that's my calculator trick. Now, I hope you guys can see this clearly. So to find Z interval, remember I told you guys you're living in SAT or second bars. That's where you're, that's where you're living for this, for this course. Now you're going to SAT, and you want to go to test. So to find these calculator tricks, Z interval, P interval, all these intervals, stat, scroll over to test, okay? Now, there's a lot of stuff in here, and you're going to use a lot of this stuff in here. But all the stuff initially, you see how it ends in test? That all goes along with, comp, uh, with hypothesis testing. You're not running a test. You want an interval. So scroll down past all that until you start seeing interval, interval, int. You want an interval, so it has to end in interval or int. And if I have this scenario where I want a confidence interval for a mean and sigma is known, I look for Z interval, okay? Z interval, which on mine is number seven, okay? Now, Sarah was asking, you know, how do I know to use Z or T? If sigma was unknown, it would be T interval. Okay, that's the difference between the two. When you go into it, and everybody found it, right? Z interval. Press enter. Just this is what it looks like. Can you see this clearly? Yes. Yes. Okay, good. So <clears throat> you see how in Z interval it has data or it has stats. And if I go over to stats and highlight stats, you see how it asks directly for this stuff, you know, sigma, x bar, and let's assume I don't have the stats, right? We have the data. I want data. 
I input these values into my, you know, it's asking for a list now. So when I have a list of numbers, I use data. Notice also that it asks for sigma when I'm in the interval, because in order to basically use the interval, I need to know sigma. Sarah, what's up? Um, the data, I think, is it when, we use data only when we have list of data, right? Yeah, and you have to obviously put it into your calculator first because it's asking where the list is. Yeah, and um, the frequency is, is, is it, because some of the numbers has like repeated. Um, Leave the frequency one because you just input all of them, right? Leave the frequency one. Right. So my sigma, let's do it together. My sigma or our sigma for now is 1.2 that was given to us. The list, I put it in L1. So wherever you put your list and if it's not there, you press second and one for L1, second, two for L2, wherever you need it. Keep frequency list one, you don't need to change, keep that one. C level is your confidence level, which is given to you. In this particular example, it's 92%. And we wanna, we wanna put our confidence level as a decimal, so 0.92. Okay, so most of, this is really, it's just given to you, right? I don't think I had to like calculate anything to put in here. <clears throat> and then it gives me everything. Um, actually, let me put this in your notes. This is the output for this problem. Let me put this here. Right? This is the output that we got. And you guys should match. Right? So this is this is what it gives me after I do everything. And you'll notice that <clears throat> the first thing, well, let's let's talk about this one. This one we should know, right? This is my sample mean. And I told you once you do Z interval or T interval or whatever, it gives you your sample mean if you need it. So you know, you could find that old school way or you could do it this way, 7.168. Either method works, okay? You can either add up all the values, divide by the amount you have. You can use, you know, one bar stats if you want to, or you could just find the interval and then, you know, um, it gives it to you if you don't already have it. So this is my sample mean, right? It gives me my sample standard deviation as well if I need that. I don't necessarily need that right now, but this is the standard deviation of this sample. Notice that it's different than the population standard deviation, right? Don't confuse the two. S, X on your calculator, S is your sample standard deviation, and sigma is your population standard deviation. So it gives me the sample standard deviation. Let me see what she put up. It gives me the sample standard deviation. I don't necessarily need it here, but if I do, if I'm asked for it, Okay, so <clears throat> this is like a input. You input your numbers here for, for the, you know, for this particular problem. We are 92% confident that this species of bacteria takes on an average between. So if I look at this, the top part of it is your interval. It is in interval notation though, okay? So if you remember from college algebra, this is an interval notation. This is your interval and interval notation. Now this is just one way to represent an interval because I think in in your um, your assignments, you basically are asked on different problems, the interval in different in different ways. So this one is saying between and between, but here, I'm gonna show it three, dif three different ways. So interval notation, in this particular case, 6.7478 is the lower end, comma, 7.5882 is the upper end. This is the interval. It's an open interval. If you remember, parentheses means I'm not including the ends. If I had a bracket, that would mean I'm including, but these intervals are always open. If I were representing in, you know, inequality notation with the less than symbols, this could be represented as 
the sample, I'm sorry, the population mean is between the value 6.7, this is a decimal, 6.7478 and 7.5882. So what does that mean? I'm going to go back up. I forgot what we were representing. We were talking about the average time it takes for this particular species of bacteria to divide the population of that species. So on average, we would say the population of uh, uh, this species of bacteria takes on average between 6.74 seconds, hours, and 7.5882 hours. I'm 92% confident in that. We are 92% confident that the species of bacteria takes on average between 6.7478 hours and 7.5882 hours. So now I know let me see. They're taking a bunch of decimals, so you're good. <clears throat> now, they have a way of representing, uh, so this is interval notation, this is your kind of inequality notation. They call it tri-inequality notation. And I'll probably represent it all three ways for all of them that we find. And then there's one more that shows uh, like this. It's, a, it's like, like x plus or minus. So you might see one where it's like plus or minus. Let me see if I have one like this, plus or minus. Give your answer to two places and it says plus or minus blank. Um, blank plus or minus blank. What that is doing is telling you basically to take, this is called your point estimate, the sample value, and add and subtract the margin of error, which would be what you would do if you were finding it by hand. So it's just separating the two. So in this particular example, representing it that way would look like um, my sample mean 7.168 plus or minus my margin of error, which was this point 0 0.4202. So three ways that you could represent the interval for this particular kind of situation for your confidence intervals. And you will be asked for all three of them depending on the problem. Each problem you might ask for a different notation. But they all mean the same thing. And this is my interpretation. This is the interpretation of the interval. You have a specific confidence level and the higher the confidence level, right, you're going to see um, the more confident I am in an interval of values, the more values in the interval, the wider the interval. So, you know, that would make sense because if I'm more confident in the interval, then I'm going to have a more variety of values within that. And then the less confident I am, the more narrower the interval is. You might be asked stuff like that when it comes to maybe some of these problems, right? The more confident I am, the more values within, the more wider the interval. And then the less confident in the interval I am, um, the more narrower the interval. So <clears throat> one more thing here, the margin of error, which I could find with the formula and that's what I did, but if you guys want to just use the calculator trick, <laughs> um, you could potentially find your margin of error taking the upper value, I guess, uh, I say upper, I don't know what you confuse it with. So maybe I'll say max. Max value in your interval minus the min value and divide by two. So if I were to do this, take the maximum value, 7.5882 minus the minimum value, 6.7478, and then divide by two. So that's 7.5882 minus. 6.7478 and then divide by 2. I get the same thing that I did using the formula. So if I were doing this problem personally, based on the fact that I know the calculator trick and based on the fact that they're asking for each of these pieces, 
I would skip A. I would do B and C because that's just finding, uh, you know, English norm and stuff. I would skip D. I would do my interval first and then come back to D and come back to A because the calculator trick will give me all that. If you want, you can also just use your formulas to find these things as well and walk step by step. But if you were, in fact, doing a confidence interval using your formulas, you would have to go through this whole process step by step every single time. And I want you to notice also, if I take the sample mean 7.168 and I subtract the marginal error 0.4202, I get the low end of the interval. And if I take the sample mean, 7.168, and I add the margin of error, 0 0.4202, I get the higher end of the interval, which is what this is telling you to do if you were calculating the interval by hand. So I started with this particular problem because it does walk through each of these steps which you do need to know how to do, but not every problem is asking for that. Like this one's not asking for that. So um, let me stop recording for a second. <clears throat> and I